G'day viewers, I'm Adam Stokes, back with our longtime friend Martin North. Martin, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. How are you, my friend? I'm extremely good, and uh, you might note the um, DFA little logo with the Christmas hat on, right? It's just the last opportunity to show it this year. Mate, I only noticed that when you pointed it out. Uh, I've noticed that your channel is moving very quickly. You are pumping out so much material. I can't keep up. What's the go? Is there, a, <laughs> is there an end state in mind, or are you just motivated at the moment? Well, I, I think, um, to be honest, uh, it's more about just um, doing what I'm doing because I can do what I can do. In other words, <laughs> I, I've, got, I've invested in the studio over the last five or six years, right? And I finally got it pretty much working the way I want it, which means it's so much easier to make cut shows. So, you know, for example, we are recording this real time and I'm actually making the cuts as we speak, which means that I don't have to go and do a lot of um, editing afterwards. So that really makes the whole production cycle completely different. right? And that means that I can pump out more um, shows more quickly and I spend less time doing the boring stuff, which is all the editing and tweaking afterwards, because I've got the levels right to start with. I've got the, 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 the balancing right. So in a way, investing in the studio has been the best thing I've done because it's allowed me to spend more time on the content, weirdly. Editing is a killer for me. I recently released a mini documentary. Uh, it took me uh, a couple of weeks to script. Uh, a few hours to shoot, but then weeks to edit. And that editing is just a killer. And I now understand, uh, as I make more YouTube videos, why editing is such a big thing in Hollywood and in the production industry, that editing and sound alone are separate industries uh, that require a great deal of respect because uh, I can assure you it's been a big headache to me. But you're looking good. Your introduction is looking great as well. Uh, and I understand that some people weren't used to the change when you first changed your introduction <laughs> to something that they were very used to. Well, it's really weird because uh, I've, this is now the third incarnation of my introductions, right? The first one, which was uh, the one I produced two or three years ago, was just a, a drum beat and a very basic a graphic. I still have people hankering for that particular one, right? Nostalgia style, right? And then I did another one, which was a bit more um, upmarket, and then I've made a change in the last couple of months. And I changed my background slightly as well uh, recently just to make uh, it a little fresher. And it's interesting how some people love the new ones, but also some people yearn for the old one so i've learned that you cannot please all of the people all of the time well said well said indeed martin three main areas we want to discuss today or certainly i do is uh rental markets yep. uh, then the great reset and then the future of money now when we get into the rental markets a couple of videos that have really pointed uh stuck out in my mind is first of all one that got uh 20 000 views but it's quite new is australia will pay foreigners to buy a new home in perth Mate, this is mind-boggling to me. I understand on a macro level, I guess, the theory behind getting more people into the country to give us more money. But, of course, reading through a lot of your comments, a lot of Australians are very angry by this because, of course, you've got people who can't afford to buy a home in Australia. And it appears that the government is going to give more money to people outside of Australia who aren't Australians to buy property in Australia. And I just want to quickly read your qu closing quote on the video where it said, I'm afraid that property, government stimulus and stupidity all go in the same sentence, words very wisely spoken. Is this a federal or state initiative and is it really going ahead? Well, uh, it's a bit of a combination of both, right? So basically there's a federal um, program which effectively is trying to uh, get people to uh, particularly buy new constructed homes and in Western Australia they added it so effectively there's $50,000 up for grabs combination of federal and state right to get people to go and buy new home and land packages right so that's basically the and what happened as soon as they announced it was that prices for new homeland packages went up by precisely $50,000, right? So the first point to make is all these stimulus packages are a zero-sum game. It doesn't actually give you any real benefit in terms of trying to get into the market, despite the fact, of course, that everybody believes that the government is, you know, being helpful to people to get into the market. This is all about helping the construction sector. So that's the first part of the argument, right? So that is definitely certain, and there have been quite a significant number of new homeland packages sold in Western Australia and particularly around Perth as a result of it. But the point that I made in that other show was that it appears that foreign investors can also access it. Now, you know, 
the Western Australian government sort of was very coy about it and said, well, we haven't had any applications so far, but a couple of the Western Australian property portals with connections to China have been spruiking this like mad and saying, it's amazing, you know, you can come to Australia, you can invest from an international perspective and you can get $50,000 to start with um, just to buy a new homeland package. So um, if it is true and if it is actually something which is accessible to um, people from overseas to access Australia, I think it's a really dumb move. Um, more broadly, I would say that these all these incentives are just frankly kicking the can down the road. This is all about supporting the construction sector. This is all about the government aligning with big business and you know the construction industry. It's nothing to do with helping housing affordability. Prices are going up. It's nothing to do with helping people to acquire their first home reasonably and sensibly. It's just stoking the can, stoking the fire, and frankly creating bigger issues down the track. I recall uh, when I was first getting into the property market years ago when John Howard introduced the, I believe it was $7,000 at first, then he cranked it up to $14,000. And exactly what you said occurred. All prices went up by exactly that amount yep. and, and then and some, and then it really charged forward. So it, it appears that we, we just don't learn from this. All that happens is when we put in a government incentive to say, here's free money, well, the commercial market just goes, cool, thanks for that free money. We'll take care of that. We'll put up all the prices. <laughs> it, it leads me to the question, do you have a solution for Aussie battlers out there? Let's picture your Prime Minister of the country. We're going to say, right, Mr North, Prime Minister North, we can put you in charge of making a new policy to allow battle, battlers out there to get into the property market. How do we do it? It's a real complicated question to try and answer now because we've got ourselves into the situation where our banks are over leveraged into property, right? If prices start falling at all, they're going to have huge issues with regard to their liquidity and the risks of uh, default later. Um, so this is a long-term structural issue which cannot be solved by tactical, frankly, short-term stupidity, right, which is what, what I see going on. And it's interesting, just to give you a couple of other data points, you know those superannuation withdrawal programs, you know, yeah. 10k plus 10k each, mm -hmm. each side of, um, you know, June? Well, um, that means that you can grab another $20,000 from your superannuation and stick that into a deposit to add to the $50,000 that you can get from the, the government, right? I mean, how much more do you want to take this? I mean, why don't you just give everybody a house and say, have it for free? I mean, you might just as well, because the strategy is not actually helping, right? So we have to get to the point where we start with the realisation that property is massively overvalued in Australia by at least 40% against long-term averages. And you can't just keep continuing to stoke this by more and more debt just forever, right? There has to be a change in approach. So my view is, step one, we've got to stop all these additional incentives. We've just got to get that out the way. Step two is we have to let property prices settle back to uh, longer-term averages, which means taking away some of the supports that have been there for a, a third a, a long time and thirdly we have to recognize that we are going to see higher levels of default and we're going to see higher levels of pain in the short term but we cannot continue to let these prices continue to run because if you do then you've got to ask yourself the question well how much is a fair value of a property three thousand five thousand you know um three thousand five thousand three thousand five hundred million billion i mean where do you where do you take it right because mm. essentially if you look at the trajectory of home prices relative to incomes and home prices relative to debt it's all debt driven which means we're pumping up the balance sheets of the banks we're pumping up the uh, the value of real estate it's artificial it's so so i would tackle it the other way to say we've got to stop the continued inflation of home prices step one. Step two is we need to find alternative mechanisms to be able to deal with true housing uh, capacity where it's required. But we've got an oversupply of property. So it's not like there's not enough property being built. We've actually got more problem than we need, maybe in the wrong places. And we have a huge issue with regard to homelessness and people unable to um, get homing, uh, homes. I think there's a significant role for public sector housing to be part of the mix. And unfortunately, we've been very uh, you know, slow at investing in public sector housing. So that's some, another part of the solution. And the part, final point, just bear in mind of this, if you look at the proportion of people who have property 
and particularly prod without mortgages, it's lower than it's ever been. So we've actually got a situation where we've got more people renting, we've got more people with a mortgage, even as they get into retirement, because they've got these huge mortgages now. So this is a structural issue with regard to housing that needs structural solutions, needs a combination of state and federal um, uh, activity, in my view, but it has to be done from a different perspective. You can't just go on saying, well, let's build a few more properties and you know keep house prices to go even higher and get the banks to lend even more. That is a footpath to oblivion, in my view. The real painful thing, I guess, for many Australians in the statement that you just made there about there's an oversupply of housing is that, of course, there's many Australians who want a home and yeah. even a humble home. They're not uh, necessarily after the seven bedroom, three story mansion, although that would be nice for all of us. But many <laughs> people are very reasonable in their desires just to have a home of their own. Uh, but of course, as you mentioned, there's an oversupply of houses. Now, what we've seen in the housing market is, in fact, there's a huge vacancy rate in houses. Uh, I'll give a microeconomic example here in Canberra. Uh, some investors come from overseas, buy a property, mothball that property. Yes, they pay their rates and yes, they pay any land taxes on that property, but they don't rent it out. And they don't rent it out because in some cultures, renting out a property is a disaster. Uh, in other cultures, that's the only way to do it. For example, I lived in Spain for a while and when I was at university in Spain, e everyone just rented property. Uh, however, when I lived in Asia, uh, renting out property was very nerve wracking because too many times uh, the property would be damaged by the tenants in there. So we see this big influx of certain nationalities coming into the country, buying these properties, not doing anything with that property other than mothballing it. So on one hand, the government's like, well, hey, it's great. The property prices are propped up because that house is not for sale. So it's controlling the supply. It's also great for us, the government, because we're getting our stamp duty, land taxes, rates, etc. But for the Aussie battler, we're now in this situation we're in this video that you mentioned that we're going to put in another $50,000 stimulus, which just puts the prices up and opening it up to the, um, the good people of the world to come in and, and snap these houses up from Australians. There has to be a tipping point. Hmm. And th this leads me into the rentals video that you made. So you also made a video on the S Sydney rentals collapse. Uh, that video that you got was 40,000 views. So double about uh, the, the, video we were just discussing about foreigners buying a new home in Perth. Now, you mentioned that people are leaving the city because they, they don't need to be there. And we can see that through uh, the latest virus, which I don't want to say because it seems to upset the YouTube algorithm. Le with less, a... less now than previously. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, well, it's... <laughs> There's a, a new term of freedom of speech, and that freedom of speech is determined by the YouTube gods, but we'll, yes. we'll, leave, we'll leave that there. Um, in any case, we've discovered through the virus that many people don't need to be at work. They can move away from their workplace and do everything remotely, more cost-effectively mm. from home. And this, of course, is creating huge vacancies in CBDs. Now, as we see rentals potentially be in danger, I want to discuss an economic theory that I learned many moons ago in my younger years uh, from Professor Chris Orledge about what happens when properties crash, rentals in fact increase. And that theory involves, uh, let's say you've got many people who have a mortgage as we discussed, those people can no longer afford to pay that mortgage. So they've, they're kicked out of their home or they sell their home. Certainly the prices of homes then drop because you, now you have an oversupply of homes and a very few, a little demand but the rental market increases. Why? Because now you've got more people who need to rent because they're no longer uh, buying a property, uh, no longer paying their mortgages. How do you think this theory applies in the sense when people are pulling out of uh, mortgages uh, as we move into the future and people are in more financial hardship? Do you think that in fact we could see rental prices increase? Well, it, it's interesting because that data, which was domain data showed that in and around the major urban centres of Sydney and Melbourne. There's a massive oversupply of rental accommodation. Most of it's high rise. Most of it was previously occupied by international students and uh, foreign visitors, right? All but both of which have gone away, right? On the other hand, the supply of rental homes further out, particularly houses, is very tight. So further out, rents are actually rising, right? And it's that disequilibrium based on supply and demand, which shows that that theory is, you know, supply and demand will drive rents ultimately. Now, I don't see any reason at the moment why rents are going to start moving higher in Sydney and Melbourne particularly, and 
maybe in Brisbane, but that's a slightly different market. And then beyond, you know, beyond that, it's a slightly different scenario. In Perth, rents are about 10% higher, but then they dropped the previous five years. So they're just re retracing some of their, uh, their, their previous falls. So I think we're in the situation where we have a lot of um, demand from some people for things to rent, but not necessarily the high rise. So the high rise is where the risks are. Now, unfortunately, a lot of those high rises were actually bought by property investors over th two or three years ago when prices were right at their peak. Many high rise prices have dropped since then. So they're seeing the situation where the capital value is degrading. The rental returns are zero or much lower than previously because they've got uh, nobody actually living in the property at the moment. And they've still got the mortgage to um, basically service. And I know rates are a little bit down, but nevertheless, it's still a, a big problem. And so about 60% of property investors nationally are actually underwater from a cash flow perspective. So what do you do? Well, you either hold in there and hope that you can find somebody to rent at some discounted price, which is why there's a lot of discounting, or you put the property in the market. Now, if enough people put the property on the market, it has two factors. Firstly, it reduces the supply of rental accommodation. And so there's a tipping point, and suddenly rents then start going up. And secondly, that supply of for sale property then puts downward pressure on property prices, particularly when you've got multiple sales in the same high rise block. You know, you can literally see carbon copy examples of properties for sale, which means that you then see capital values dropping further. So then property investors try and bail out quickly because if they wait, they're going to end up with a lower price. So you see a run to the exit. And that run to the exit then has a second order impact, which means it reduces the supply of rental accommodation. So again, there's a tipping point. So we could absolutely see later rents rising in some of those areas. But there's a huge oversupply. Look at Docklands down in Melbourne, right? There's a massive supply of vacant property in and around Docklands. And as you said earlier on, a lot of people actually have vacant um, holdings of those properties. They never let them at all. In fact, they didn't even think of doing that. They were just holding it for capital appreciation. Um, that is probably now unsustainable as well because capital appreciation isn't happening. And, you know, whilst everyone's now claiming that property prices are on the, on the rise again, it actually houses in some areas are on the rise, units hardly at all, and all these high-rise um, constructions and there's more still being built, so there's more supply coming on, it's going to put more downward pressure on capital values. So, yeah, that's the situation that I see. Um, expect rentals to continue to slide. Expect more property investors to run to the exit. Um, I think the first quarter, first half of next year will be when a lot of them do that. As a result of that, net net in a year's time, rents could be higher again. I I think the main point for all of us to remember in the property market is that there's markets within markets. And uh, as you outlined, uh, the properties out in the suburbs uh, is showing different rental returns than those right in the CBD. Another thing that I noticed certainly with, um, I guess, within my properties, those that have big bedrooms, as a lot of bedrooms, so five, six bedrooms, they are less appealing to the market now mm. than a one bedroom apartment. Because when people are, you know, trying to save money they're quite willing to give up four bedrooms but they still need one uh but it's not really the other way around where people are oh, times are tough i'll move from this one bedroom apartment into a five bedroom mansion <laughs> yeah well it varies i mean it does vary because there are people looking for larger places because they're going to spend more time at home rather than actually commuting to the office and they're going to you know worry they want a room for their kids etc etc so that's part of it but you're also right that um, in a downturn, and we've had a lot of people who have been renting who have suddenly been unable to pay their rents. They've got rental repayment holidays, which are coming to an end now. There's a huge confusion amongst many people as to whether their rentals are postponed or whether they've been forgiven. That's another issue which is going to come home to roost over the next six months. So we're seeing quite a few people moving from larger properties into smaller properties to reduce the outgoings on rent because their incomes are still not recovered thanks to the virus. So yeah, all of those complexes there. But you're right, markets within markets within markets. You cannot generalise about property and you can certainly not generalise about investment properties. You have to go granular to really understand what's going on, which is why I do a lot of that down at the postcode and regional and suburban levels because 
I can point to very different dynamics in different postcodes um, and you know even suburbs within postcodes but uh, generally I would say that uh, probably closer into the center of town are looking pretty sick particularly apartments houses holding their value a little bit more closer in houses out in the sticks out in the suburbs out in the outer lying areas where there's been a massive supply also under huge pressure this is not a sector of the market that is going to look pretty I think for the next 12 to 18 months I recall flying uh, from Las Vegas to the Grand Canyon many years ago and as you fly from the city out towards the canyon you can see it's kind of like a, a cancer growing across the desert. You can see the, the roads being carved into the desert and then cookie cutter houses, just this production line of houses spreading out into the desert. And I think at one stage Las Vegas was, and I could be wrong on these quotes, but I think the population was increasing by 5,000 people. I believe it was per week or per month. It was it was a, a really intense rate of increase and as a result when you flew over the city you could actually see this city expanding remarkably quickly and of course when they had their downturn all these properties uh, they just stopped being built and what actually happens is in the suburbs when they stop being built if they're not complete uh, for example they've got a, uh, the walls up but not the roof or vice versa the elements take hold of these structures and you actually lose twice because you can't just turn the structure back on building, say, two years later. The structure's then being compromised, so then you have these other flow-on effects. Martin, it's a big mess. Uh, I'm I'm concerned about it, which leads us to my next question for you, is, is about the Great Reset. So we can see a mess in the virus, uh, property markets, money, the dilution of money, stimulus packages, where do I stop? A theory has come up about the Great Reset. What is it? Does it have merit? And do you support it? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, there's been more videos made about the Great Reset in the last couple of months than I think I've ever seen. So the World Economic Forum is where a lot of it came from. And there was an article uh, published a few years ago, um, I think by a Scandinavian politician, that was sort of painting a picture of a future, right? A future in which ever, everything basically was not owned but was digitally enabled. That, you know, basically if you needed a, um, a pan to cook a meal, you'd order it and it would arrive and then you'd use it and, you know, so you don't own anything, right? And, and that really was a sort of a crystallization of a vision which was a digitally enabled future where the normal verities of owning property and uh, you know actually the more you own the better um, all changed so that's sort of the first angle and it's interesting because the world economic forum when they first published that particular blog post was pretty overt about it they subsequently changed the title and they actually watered down the um, commentary around the blog post to say, well, you know, we're just talking about one future. We're not saying necessarily that it's the, you know, the only way to go. But that has been a very linchpin argument for many people who say, oh, hang on a moment, the, the combination of digitalization, um, the, the, the removal of property, the, the, you know, the, the, the destroying of property rights, the idea of essentially creating a community where nobody owns anything, right, is part of the vision. So that's the first part. The second part is there have been a number of um, speeches given by um, United Nations and the World Economic Forum saying we can't go on the way we're going, right? And that's taking account of climate change, it's taking account of the fact that we've got more debt than we've ever had before, the, the fact that the inequality that's building more and more between the rich and the poor, both within societies and across societies, is unsustainable. And in fact, even Prince Charles has pretty much said this cannot go on, we need a different way of thinking, right? So I do believe that there is a need for a different way of thinking. Absolutely, I, I, I agree about that. Because the mechanisms we've got in place, both in terms of the way that capitalism is currently working or not working, the distribution of wealth to a smaller and smaller uh, proportion of the population, both locally and globally, look at the share markets around the world and who owns it, right? Uh, the fact that we are not tackling climate change and the environmental issues that clearly are there, um, people are beginning to wake up some at least the fact that we are part of an eco environment rather than setting us in opposition to it right so many people think of the planet as a thing to exploit except that we're actually on the planet so if we exploit it too much we actually end up 
you know, frankly disappearing, right, as a species. So that is the sort of the second angle in terms of um, the, the so-called reset. The third angle is the financial structure. So we've got the Federal Reserve and the other banks around the world just printing more and more liquidity, right, on the assumption that this is magically going to solve the financial crisis that we've had for at least 10 years or more, except that the more you print the worse it becomes, the more deflationary it becomes rather than inflationary it becomes, and frankly, the more unstable the financial markets are. And you know, they're overpriced at the moment. Why? Because there's so much money being printed. So again, from a financial perspective, from an eco perspective, from an equality perspective, from a social perspective, things need to change. But the question then is, how do you wrought change? And that's the key question, right? Because if you start with a top-down model... And the World Economic Forum was going to hold a conference at the beginning of this year to talk about how this might be engineered. They're going to kick it out a few months, I think, down the track. Is it going to be top down? Is it going to be the elite, you know, the Davros mob, etc.? cetera? Um, or is it Davos? I always get Davros and Davos modeled up, right? One's the Dalek and the other's the conference. <laughs> or maybe there's a, there's a reason why they're so close. I don't know. Um, but the point, the point really is there that there needs to be a different way of thinking. How do you execute it? Do you do it, execute it top down? Well, we're, we're on one planet, clearly. You know, we've got um, one atmosphere that we're sharing around the planet, but we've also got lots of local economies. We've got lots of um, different um, countries saying, no, 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 we want to be our own uh, master rather than actually dancing to a macro tune. So that's, that's how I read it. So absolutely, we need to have different ways of thinking economically, socially, structurally, and financially. But I'm not sure necessarily that the mode of engagement and the ideas that are being thrown out at the moment are actually that compelling. And many people are getting scared by them and they're also feeling, frankly, there's little control, right? It's being imposed top down. And you could argue that through the UN and through the World Economic Forum and cascades down into the um, political systems within countries and then, you know, imposed. There is very little consultation, in my view, at the local level, and that's a problem. And I actually personally would turn the whole thing over and say, no, no, we need to actually start building different ways of thinking locally to build out rather than impose top down. And that's a very unpopular thing to say because it changes the role of politicians rather than them dictating. They actually become servants. Well, for me, that's probably the right answer. So there you go. A long winded way of saying there's some stuff in there that's really important, but the way it's being communicated, it's really scary. The there's two points I want to touch on there that I, I quite concern me quite a bit. I don't know if you can hear my rooster in the background. It's going off. It's. Uh, <laughs> I thought rooster. I've had a rooster. I've got a rooster for the first time. Just to digress, and I thought roosters only made noise in the morning, but apparently no, no. they like to make no. morning uh, noise all day. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, They're asserting their um, you know superiority. Uh, uh, he's actually quite a gentleman. So I've got like six chickens, and whenever I give him a treat, he'll take the treat and lay it out to the girls and say. <laughs> You That's are bribery. Oh, it, <laughs> and yeah, he, he always puts them first. I rarely see him eat because he's always feeding the the ladies. Anyway, the <laughs> back to money. Uh, except for my uh, moving on from my chickens, the the thing that I think about when they talk about uh, no one owns anything, everyone rents everything. No. Well, th there's two sides to this. First of all, someone's got to own it because if you're renting something, where's the money going? And if the state owns it, we are actually moving to a social. Uh, but but, but the whole point about that is you don't need money. You don't have to pay for anything. Of course, which leads us to communism. Yeah. So, which leads to the second point, which is what you're talking about, is that if we go from a top-down approach, it's it's a government rule approach. It's a yeah. communist approach. Correct. And I, I agree with you entirely. It should be from a bottom-up approach. Now, bring in the power of, my, of the blockchain. This might be a good segue to crypto, which we're about to touch on. So, beyond Bitcoin, there is, in fact... Uh, smart contract coins that can execute contracts that uh, they say are owned by no one. But of course, someone's got to own something, even if you've got a share in the company. For example, if you have a taxi that is a self-driving taxi, a self-servicing taxi, meaning it drives to its self-servicing modular service station where one component is removed by a robot, then re-put in, everything's modular where it happens very quickly. No one, in fact, has to own that taxi. The taxi, there's no driver, there's no director who owns it. But of course, there is a smart contract coin that the people are investing in, which get a return on that coin. And to me, that's very exciting in the crypto space. Now, this can go to anything from taxis to, uh, as you mentioned, a frying pan, uh, renting a PlayStation, 
anything. Uh, Airbnb is another one where smart contracts own properties as opposed to an individual owning a property. But the smart contracts are, of course, that money is coming from the people and the returns are going back to the people. If we take the other approach where it's all from the top down, we are in a communist state. We are in a communist state where everything is owned by the government. If you don't play that, play that game, you end up in a gulag somewhere or in a Siberian camp, per se, and you, you're taking away power to the people. Uh, but of course, I agree with you, there needs to be a reset. We need to move away from where we are at the moment because the poverty gap or the wealth gap is getting wider and wider and wider, and it is getting more difficult for people to deal with the nonsense that is fiat, which is my segue, my friend, into the world of crypto. Now, as you know, my channel is uh, primarily focused on crypto. Uh, I certainly explore uh, all economics, but the reason why I got into YouTube was because I found this great technology that I'm immensely excited about. Now, when we first met 12 months ago, and, and by the way, this is about our 12 month anniversary, hmm. uh, Martin. So. I know. Good to work with you. Um, when we first met, it was uh, Bitcoin was trading at nine thousand and sixty-one Australian dollars, and as of today, it's around the thirty-seven thousand dollar mark. In percentage increases over the last three months, Bitcoin's up one hundred and thirty-four percent, or three hundred and two percent since we first spoke. Uh, and over the last five years, Bitcoin is up eleven thousand four hundred and sixty-eight percent. Now, these numbers get a bit mind-boggling, my friend. Over the last 10 years, noting that some people believe Bitcoin's a fad, but we're now going back 10 years, Bitcoin is up 1.82 million percent. And over the last 11 years, which is essentially the lifetime of Bitcoin, uh, take a seat, viewers, Bitcoin is up 3.48 million percent. Let's contrast this to gold quickly. Gold in the last year up 20% up 60%, 66% over the last five years and up 38% over the last decade. So we're talking 3 million percent versus 38%. At what point, my friend, can I convince you that Bitcoin is a good thing to invest in? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a good thing to speculate in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I hold Bitcoin, just so you know. I have good man. I've held Bitcoin for some long time because, one, I wanted to understand it, and the best way to understand it is to hold it and use it and, and see how it works. Um, the, 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 let me tell you a, a little story. I don't know whether you've ever come across a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes. It is by far one of the most brilliant books by Douglas Adams. He wrote it years and years ago. It started as a radio series, published book. It's been films and things. But there's a wonderful bit in there when he's wandering around looking up and sees this really really big statue of himself hanging in the sky right and he asks what's holding the statue up right and he's told it's art art is holding the statue up right in other words you can't really see it and explain it but it's just there right now i would argue that the value of bitcoin is a bit the same right why is the value of Bitcoin where it is? It's Well, it's the supply and demand, it's the market movements, etc., etc. But there's no underlying underpinning it, right? So, you know, it can go a lot higher, it can go a lot lower. That's why I call it speculative, right? So it doesn't have a lot of the characteristics of what I would define normally as money. And, you know, it may well go high, it may come back, who knows? Um, the chances are that in the future financial transactions will be digitalized and the bitcoin or bitcoin mark ii or some equivalent of it or a central bank digital currency series will be e enabled to enable that to happen so i'm absolutely clear about that i also think that if you look at the recent moves up in terms of bitcoin it's driven by three things firstly it's driven by many institutional investors and investment banks getting seriously into bitcoin Secondly, PayPal has now announced and it's going to use um, settlement by Bitcoin on their platforms, although there's some slightly weird ways around they're going to do it. And thirdly, a lot of new money that came into the financial markets over the last six months or so, partly because of the government handouts and partly because of you know, the other mechanisms, a lot of that went into Bitcoin also went into other financial assets too. So there is a little bit of a sort of a speculative momentum here. So it could well go higher. 
Um, like I say, I do hold some Bitcoin, but I would not bank all my savings into a Bitcoin um, at the moment. I would want to hold a few percentage max and ride it up if it goes up and then perhaps sell it. And I actually think we might be at another peak and it might well then come back a little. So maybe is a good time to um, liquidate some of that um, um, value that's been created um, rather than just hold it. And that's not financial advice, just my observation looking at the charts. Right. Um, and, you know, let me just show you this is this is the um, the Bitcoin chart. Um, in US dollar terms, because I think you were quoting Aussie dollar terms, but I'm just using the US dollar. So it's up 251% from the start of this year, right? And you can see how it's really gone up in the last um, few few weeks dramatically. Um, the question is, is that going to essentially be the, um, uh, you know, is, it, is that essentially going to be the um, uh, end of it? Is it going to come back? Is it not going to come back? I don't know. It's inter it'll be very interesting to see. Um, but, you know, I have always said, think of it as a speculative asset with some potential for the future, right? It is certainly um, yet to have the characteristics of what I would regard as something where I'd put the bulk of my savings in on the assumption that I can get it out when I want and I actually know what the value of it is. I agree with you entirely that there should be no... I don't think there should be any investment that you put all your money in. I, nothing. I, in fact, I don't even say you should put all your money in money. And what I mean by that is keeping all your money in, say, Australian dollars or US dollars is dangerous. It's dangerous because you're constantly faced with the erosion of that money through inflation, bank fees, um, uh, bail-in laws, uh, a cash ban, when they, which we'll talk about in a second when they were attempting to do that. So uh, definitely don't put all your money, uh, all your eggs in one basket. Uh, the same would probably go for gold. I mean, there's a theory out there. It's just a theory. Imagine that they find uh, at the bottom, there is one theory, but they find a, a huge amount of uh, gold at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And suddenly all the gold supply, and from memory, I could be wrong, this viewers leave it a, a comment below. I think there's only about two or three Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of gold that we've dug up. Uh, it, it's not that much in, in the big picture. But let's say at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, they find five swimming pool, Olympic size swimming pools worth of solid gold. Well, suddenly the market's just doubled or tripled the supply. Uh, perhaps demand will pull back as well. And then suddenly gold has pulled back. So even if we see a small increase in gold, as I mentioned, 20% uh, in one year, 66% over five years, and 38% over a decade comparative to these numbers of nearly 300 percent, 11,000 percent and 3.48 million percent. I, I think the term I use now is that it's becoming financially irresponsible to not put something into Bitcoin, like 20 bucks, a, a cup of coffee, five bucks. Uh, and mind you, a cup of coffee is probably going to be 20 bucks soon with the amount of uh, money that we see pouring in there as in to the economy. And that goes to what you're talking about before about PayPal using crypto. So PayPal is using crypto not just as a settlement method, that is, do you want to pay in Australian dollars, US dollars or Bitcoin? They're also saying, would you like to buy Bitcoin, mm -hmm. which is now becoming overnight the biggest exchange in the world with uh, the stroke of a key where you can now buy Bitcoin uh, once it's finalized on PayPal instantly. Now, to me, this just shows more and more confidence in the sense that when when Bitcoin first came in, it was really computer nerds. And then when the Silk Road came on, probably naughty people using buying bad stuff on the internet. Then you had geeks uh, coming in or money speculators such as myself saying, hey, this, this thing's got a big future. Over the last 12 months, we can now see, as you mentioned, institutional investors coming in, massive amounts of money, huge amounts of money coming in from multi-billion dollar companies that are saying, hey, uh, as I mentioned, it's now financially irresponsible to not start putting money in into this. I recently released a mini documentary that I recommend uh, everyone check out. It's a lot of work put into it on the four greatest risks to Bitcoin. And of, of those four greatest risks, two were government related. And one of them was, the last two was the government saying, we ban all crypto. Crypto is banned. Uh, and there's a, a counter argument to that in the documentary that I recommend that you watch. But the, the last argument in that documentary was about a Bretton Woods 2.0, a Bretton Woods agreement where the government basically comes in and seizes all gold, as in digital gold, the Bitcoin, and replaces it with their dirty fiat money. From 
let's say Bitcoin does continue in its growth and its adoption and its confidence in the market, uh, noting that I do acknowledge that you said that, you know, what makes Bitcoin valuable and uh, there is one half is just the speculation of the people, the people investing in it. But the other part of Bitcoin being valuable is that it takes a lot of energy, a lot of actual money to invest, to, to create a Bitcoin, to mine it from the from the algorithm. If we have a situation where the government comes in and says we're banning Bitcoin or you've got to surrender your Bitcoin for a dirty fiat. My fear in that situation is a there could be an uprise from the people if more if people are sick of the fiat uh, currency or we just see another dilution of fiat again. My question to you, my good friend, is I don't trust in fiat because we can see it's constantly declined and it's, it's fake. The, the money is fake. And the only reason why it's there is because of a decree, a decree by the government. Hmm. Other people, to go to balance the argument, other people don't believe in Bitcoin because they say it's not real, I can't touch it. It's just this magical computer money. Then we have the third, if we are making a triangle of money, then we have gold. We have blocks of gold, which uh, is a true money in the sense that if you look, I watched a really good documentary recently where they're saying gold has pretty much held its value consistently throughout the past few thousand years. And what they're talking about that is not comparative to the dollar because we can see the nominal amount of gold going up. That is, you know, it's now, I think, 1600 US dollars compared to $1,000. But of course, that doesn't account for inflation. So the problem with gold is comparative to digital fiat and digital crypto is that I can't text you gold from here in Australia to America if I want to buy something off Amazon. It has to be digitized. And the only way it can be digitized is through two methods. One, through a centralized third party, which is a bank. Or two, through a decentralized system that no one controls, which is something like cryptocurrency, mm. Bitcoin. Mm. If we don't want to go with digital fiat, and we don't want to go with digital crypto, and we can't go with physical gold, what other alternative is there to money? <laughs> yeah, and I've, I actually made a couple of shows with regard to the digital gold and basically using you know the blockchains and the crypto to be able to actually um, exchange and settle in gold, right? Um, and you know I, I did an interview with Peter Schiff, um, who is a very strong advocate of gold as the foundational value setting element in the whole of the economy. His argument is that the US dollar is going to fall over and become less relevant. He's also reasonably um, um, positive with regard to uh, um, you know, the digital currencies as well. Um, and, and so I, we are at this crossroads, in my view, as to whether the future is going to be same as same old previously, where effectively we continue to devalue and we uh, basically just um, pump the value of money up and up and up so the, the real value goes down and down and down, which, of course, is where we've been for a, for a long time. Um, whether the alternative of that is a gold-based system or whether it's a digital-based system. Um, I always remember Mark Carney's um, conversation, I think it was a couple of year, years ago, Jackson Hole saying his argument is it's not going to be the yuan that's going to take over from the dollar. It's going to be a digitally-based alternative. And then I start asking questions about who's going to control it, who's going to set the value of it, et cetera, et cetera, right? And there is ultimately a devolved um, or controlled discussion going on here because central banks and governments will want to keep control of the currencies and will want to stop money laundering all of those things um, many of the other alternatives of decentralization um, requires effectively less control although as you look closely what you'll discover is that even holders of bitcoin now have to register and in some countries now bitcoin transactions are tracked so even that freedom is probably uh, not uh, uh, completely there and in some cases illusory so I think we're in this hiatus right I don't yet know precisely how this is going to play out right and I think that we could see it go a number of different ways it comes back to the question of the great reset what we do know is we need a currency that is reliable that is actually able to exchange value easily and conveniently and has a certain degree of autonomy but also a certain degree of control because you cannot allow total global currencies to be effectively completely um, out of control I think most people would say although you know is all the control there actually quite useful so I think the future is going to be digitally aligned 
I still am not sure whether it's a central bank digital currency or whether it's some alternative or some version of a Bitcoin type thing. I notice that many of the other smaller coins are disappearing rather than actually following Bitcoin up the, uh, the value curve. And that may say something about the concentration um, towards Bitcoin over time. But I do think the future is generally open. And I'm not sure that the future is simply going to be a replication of what we've seen over the last 10 years. Certainly Bitcoin dominance at the moment, 70%. So the, the market shows that 70% of all the money in crypto is is focused on Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, XRP is the one that has taken a big hit lately. Uh, but no, the, the I guess the top 20 have been tracking very well. Uh, there's a lot of confidence in the crypto yeah. space. Yep. The, um, just, just one quick clarification on, on tracking money. I certainly agree that if you have a dark money that no one can see, uh, let's call it, for example, the US dollar, uh, it, it creates a big opportunity for people to do uh, illegal activity. And of course, the number one currency of choice around the world at the moment for illegal activity is the US dollar. Hmm. Bitcoin, you can actually, is far more traceable than people realize. The Australian government um, did actually push recently to ban what's called privacy coins. An example of that is Monero. So Monero is a type of crypto, or is a cryptocurrency, but its power is that it is completely non-traceable. And those, in my opinion, are the type of coins that would probably be targeted by the government. And we can see that with what the Australian government did by pushing, uh, putting pressure on uh, exchanges by saying you can no longer list this coin because it act does actually enable uh, the complete anonymity of money tracking uh, around the world. And you can't stop it. Whereas Bitcoin, you can actually see where it has gone, who's got it, wh what the wallet's linked to. And what I think we've done well in Australia is, as you mentioned, we have to, when you're buying Bitcoin or registering to be on an exchange, you have to give KYC, know your customer, personal details. And that's why when people first get into crypto, they're like, I don't want to give over my details. Yet that's exactly what you do when you go to a bank. You can't open to a go to a bank and say, G'day, I'm Jono, I want to open a bank account. The first thing they say is that you got ID. And of course, that model is now being transferred over to the crypto space. I guess what it comes down to, Martin, is digital currencies are already here. We already use digital fiat. As we move away from digital fiat, where you have an endless supply of money being pumped out, it really, in my mind, comes down to the people. Do the people want to use a currency that is unlimited in supply and controlled by a central body, whether that central body be a bank or a government? Or do we want a completely decentralized money that is determined by the people for the people that has a set supply that can never be manipulated? I think only time will tell, my friend. Uh, but to your viewers, if they do want to buy cryptocurrency, I'll leave a link below and I encourage that you check it out. And I am very proud of you, my good friend, for having crypto. And I, I do note also, even when I first met you and we were in great debate about crypto, of which I thoroughly enjoy, you were still hedging your bets and you were still accepting Bitcoin as donations to your channel. Yep. And so I, on one hand, I'm like, well, that's kind of cheeky. Bitcoin isn't all that, but I'll take it. But on the other hand, it's like, yeah, this guy's a smart dude. He's, he's hedging his bets there. Well, you know, the, the, the truth is the future is generally open, right? What I'm concerned about is what I see in China, right? Where effectively you're seeing digital currencies aligned to social scores, aligned to facial recognition, aligned to control. Right. That for me is the nightmare scenario. I want to avoid that at all costs. And that goes right back to the Great Reset. Right. However, the Great Reset comes through and however the currency um, journey continues, I want to make sure that we maintain some personal freedom, that we maintain a degree of integrity in the system, but we're not actually being controlled and managed cent centrally either by computers, through AI, which is what the Great Reset was talking about, or through you know central bankers through what they do, right? So what I think is really important, and it's great we have these conversations, is for, to get people to think about this stuff now and to understand that there are genuinely options ahead of us, right? And we should be lobbying those in power, the politicians and you know central bankers and other people, right, for a greater openness and disclosure and discussion about these options and these futures because 
What I don't want to do is to wake up one day and suddenly discover that they've taken the Aussie dollar and given me a digital alternative and I've got no choice but to use it with this particular platform through this particular channel and every transaction is fully monitored and they know precisely everything about me. That is a future that I don't want. I agree with you. My, I guess, uh, melancholy feeling is that we are already there and allow me to give you a couple of examples. First of all, who, who doesn't use a, a credit card or a FBOS card or some type of digital card? Second of all, when you have government shop fronts that say, we don't accept our own money. To me, this is the biggest alarm. So I go and pay my rates or my uh, driver's license, whatever it is, I go down to the Australian government shop front with Australian sovereign tender. And they tell me, we don't accept that money. And I say, I don't bother having the argument, but I say in my mind, this is your money. This is the money that you made sovereign in this government and you don't accept your own money. But then they turn around and say, yes, but you have an option. You can use MasterCard or Visa, a centralized third party that will take a profit from what we do. And by the way, they'll track what you do and they can block what you do. So we're already there, my friend. We are already in this space where every dollar I spend on my card is being tracked. My own government doesn't accept their own money, which is beyond me. And then finally, I'm subjected to this money that on one hand, I can kind of use because it's the money issued by the government, but can't use because the government doesn't accept their own money. But I'm subjected to the constant inflation through pumping it. So this is where I say, I'm out. I'm out. I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to use your money. I want to use my money. And of course, this goes back to the argument where we um, we said it, d different types of money already exist. Mm. Uh, bus passes, gift vouchers, frequent flyer points, trading cards, labor. If I, you know, if I come over to your house and I mow your lawn and then you edit a video for me, th that's a c kind of money. That type of exchange already exists. I, I'm very happy about the uh, cash ban bill that you, John Adams, Robbie Barwick, uh, Alex Saunders, and a whole army of people uh, managed to stop. We spoke uh, in a video uh, some time ago about the eight phases that I created, and I, I think you ag agreed to the eight phases, but not necessarily in this order. Those eight phases were the removal of the gold standard, fractional reserve lending, bail out laws, bail in laws, negative interest rates, the cash ban, banks controlling governments, and the collapse of doc democracy. My friend, uh, credit to you, to Robbie, to John, to Alex, to the whole crew who stopped the cash ban. Uh, we worked tirelessly to stop this. And you mentioned in the video that we did a while ago is that if the cash ban got through, Bitcoin would be next on the radar. So where our worlds have come together was it was in fact around the cash ban and the mm. freedom that we we essentially fight for the democracy, the, the freedom of privacy, the freedom to spend mo our money how we want to. Uh, the cash ban bill that has been stopped is a great success to this. And it actually stops at this stage, phase seven and eight, which is banks controlling governments, which some argue is already in there. And phase eight, which is a collapse of democracy, which some say we're already moving towards. Do you foresee there will be another attack on the cash ban? And if so, will they go all the all the way this time and uh, get it through stopping Bitcoin as well? Well, I think um, the remarkable story of the cash ban, you know, the, the thousands and thousands of people who actually exercise their democratic right to express an opinion, uh, you know, they've never had as many, <laughs> as many submissions, right? They were drowning in submissions. I think it's that's a really important object lesson. There are many other things we need to fight. You know, we need to fight the bail-in still. It's not fixed yet. Um, there are other bills coming over the next uh, few months. The responsible lending bill is um, a disgrace as well. So I think we need to assert our democratic rights. But I think we've learned something really important from the cash ban that if actually people get off their seat and actually make a fuss and make an informed contribution to democracy, we can still have an impact. And that for me is a bit of a glimmer of hope. It means that actually we can wrought change if we really 
choose to and want to. So I'm actually a bit more positive than you in terms of I don't think this is uh, you know game over. I think there's still an opportunity to shape the future. I think the future is still genuinely open. And I'll be doing all I can to inform uh, my viewers and followers with regard to the issues as they come up. And we'll hopefully get uh, a bit more democratic process happening too. Interestingly, quite a few politicians also came in behind us on it as well and so backed what we were doing. So that shows another interesting angle. So in a way, democracy has migrated from Canberra to YouTube. I think it's quite interesting. And, you know, being in the middle of it is um, quite fun. So I'm a bit more optimistic, but we have to be alert. We have to be very forceful with regard to what's going on. Polite but forceful is what I want to be. And make sure that people understand the consequences of decisions that may or may not be taken. But I'd also make this final point. I don't believe that there is some central plan controlled by some central body globally that's just being rolled out and imposed. I don't think that's the way that things are actually working. I think history is much more mucky than that. There's a lot of individual decisions being taken. I do think the future is generally open, and I'm going to do all I can to keep it that way. We support you in your quest. Uh, I know a lot of Australians are very grateful for the work that you do. Uh, it's not just the number of views that you get, but the number of conversations that you stimulate. I think for every one view you get, you probably stimulate two or three conversations. So it's this multiplying effect. Uh, and as I've mentioned several times, the the reason why I was drawn to you is because we uh, have a different approach to a same outcome. And if that outcome can be achieved through path A or path B, I, I don't care. If the outcome is freedom and democracy, then I support everything that you do. And I appreciate the chance to work with you today and over the last year and hopefully in the years to come. Martin, how can people learn more about you and get more information from your channel? Okay, well, I run my channel called Walk the World. So I post videos daily there. And I also have a blog at digitalfinanceanalytics.com. Excellent. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm Adam Stokes. Links below if you want to learn more about crypto and get on this huge run. Uh, remember, 3.48 million percent over the last 11 years. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there, Martin. Uh, please do check out the links below. Martin, very grateful for your time today. Thanks for joining us. I very much enjoyed chatting with you. Take care. Happy New Year. And we should do this again sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care.